Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Cloud Wars Live. The digital revolution is in full swing, and we've got a big brain with us today to talk about what does that mean for leaders, for business people, for companies that are trying not just to survive into this big new phase, but to thrive in it. Wayne Saden is an advisor to board of directors and to CEOs about how to fuse digital and technology strategy into their business strategy to make it one inseparable unit. Wayne, thanks for being with us today. Bob, as always, it's great to be here and great to talk with you about this, this topic that I know you're talking about everywhere. It's, it is, uh, it's just extraordinary what's going on. And Wayne, um, just a little side comment here at first. I was just on a discussion with a couple of people about the wholesale distribution business. And one of the things we kept getting questions from the audience about was they kept saying, yeah, but what's the role now of DTC? And I, I was puzzled and that, I guess that direct to consumer. So wholesale distributors, sort of the name means I, I don't sell to the public, but the big dynamic today was how do you get engaged in selling to the public? So all the stuff we've known for the last few decades, it's not that we don't know it, but it's maybe not as relevant going forward as it has been until now. Well, I think over the years, we've always seen what we called in financial services, disintermediation. The famous Bill Gates quote, everybody needs banking, but nobody needs a bank. Right. So the question, um, you know, Scott Galloway in post-corona said the great dispersion, and he was talking about what we call disintermediation in FinTech applied to everything. If I'm gonna deliver things to your door, what is the role of that wholesale distributor? Why are we adding extra friction in the system? And, and that's a question we all have to answer. In fact, it's actually a question to talk about as the software industry moves to this vertical focus. Yeah. So I wanna hold that for a bit because it fits in well, but what you saw in direct to consumer Essentially, how does the software business change when we're more direct to business consumer? Uh, and I think that's important. But, but Bob, I do want to mention one thing first. You know, we have a topic for this week, but I got to talk about something. Uh, the Colonial Pipeline hack. Give me two minutes, three minutes to talk about that. So I've worked in the utilities industry several times. I've worked in critical industries, banking, lending, armored cars a number of times. Critical infrastructure is called that because it is critical to running the company. Now, the good news is I live in Texas, so I'm at the end of the pipeline that has too much oil. We don't know where to put it, so our prices are not going up, but this could be a calamity. And so the message I've got for the board of directors for the C-suites is a couple of things. First, we always talk about IT, information technology, and you get hacked and they ransomware your payroll system and you can't pay your people and that's, that's terrible. But there's another whole side to automation and it's escaped the notice of many people in IT. It's call it OT, operations technology. Going back to the old days of SCADA systems, the industrial control systems running machines. So now I've got a computer running my plastic extruder, running my fork truck in the warehouse, maybe one day running my automated truck in DTC. I've got all of the factories connected now to the internet because it's so convenient. And so where a hack in your IT system can shut your business down, a hack in your OT system can kill people. And that's what, I'm, I'm an old engineer. I used to work on the factory floor and before I got into IT. So I sense, I feel viscerally what happens when somebody messes up a machine and I can just, barely imagine what happens when somebody deliberately messes up all your machinery. So if you're on the board, if you are a C-suite CEO particularly, think about your OT and your IT, and it's time, this is the wake-up call, it's time to say, we need somebody on our board, and we need a business technologist who can help make the decisions and lead the discussion. And how are we going to protect us from cybersecurity issues? but also from technical debt issues, from obsolete systems issues. And in OT, a lot of this machinery is 30, 40, 50, 60 years old. In the water utility space, some of it's 100 years old. And we stuck a computer in it somewhere. Uh, maybe 30 years ago when two engineers got together and said, hey, this circuit board will fit. Click. Hey, we're on the internet. Yeah, right. 
And so we've got to be having a discussion as a country. We've got to be having a discussion in numbers of industries, and we've got to be having a discussion that gets the technology person in the room with the business person to discuss the risks. And of course, as I always say, the opportunities of doing this well. But we're seeing it right in front of our eyes this moment. And it's time for boards and C-suites to wake up to this change and start saying, I want a QTE, a qualified technology expert, advising me on my board, on my advisory board. So there's my little soapbox, and I hope people take it to heart. No, Wayne, it's a great point. And uh, one follow-up from that that I'd, I'd offer, um, you know, I've thought about this for a while, but you really crystallized it as absolutely they need that QTE that you've been, you know, such a passionate evangelist for. And I think the forward-looking companies that have taken your advice are going to be a lot better off for having done so. But then there's also inside the company a little bit more. Maybe we, uh, just as we're seeing, you know, in the IT space, right, the integration and end-to-end -end capabilities and so forth like that, maybe it's time to bust down some of the silos between IT and OT and realize they're not the same, but the, the more... Uh, appropriately, they can be integrated, interconnected, and thought of as the whole stuff that runs a digital business today, <clears throat> I think the better off companies are going to be. Oh, yes, absolutely. It, it is foolish to think we can run the complex industrial processes of the future using the technology of the past. I'm an old guy, so I, I once built a plastics factory when I was in my 20s, and the notion that we can have closed-loop controllers on the plastic extruder, that is something that would sense the temperature and automatically adjust the knob, mm -hmm. this was seen as revolutionary. We used to have an army of people watching dials, and then we said, hey, we could, for another $46 a controller, feed back the temperature and start adjusting within upper and lower control limits. We've got to do it. You can't run your business. You can't, you can't manufacture billions of doses of vaccine without process automation. And, you know, to your point, when I worked in the utility industry many, many years ago, the people doing the industrial controls on the nuclear reactor was not allowed to talk to these people. They had their own computers locked behind those walls because they recognized the disciplines were so different in those days. Today, the disciplines have merged, to your point. The control tool that I can use to control a shipping process can also be used to control the truck in that shipping process. We've got to automate, we've got to integrate, but recognize that, you know me in technical debt, think about the technical debt in your payroll system, think about the technical debt in your ERP, but I'm telling you it's worse when you think about a system built by five engineers with a DEC mini computer, a PDP-10, 40 years ago, because that's what engineers had, that's been running in the corner, running your factories. And now either someone accidentally connected it to the internet because they could log in from home. We had a recent case of that at a utility where uh, somebody changed the chlorine in the water, I think, because somebody had a remote control tool to make it easier for the employees to work from home. Uh, so these are things that are gonna creep in. If we don't manage them explicitly, they're being managed implicitly and without it's shadow IT all over again. It's somebody thinking best op optimally for my little domain, this machine, this control, this factory, without talking about the global picture of architecture, of info security, of, uh, of process architecture and data. So we've got to be doing it. And the time is past. But every time we get a new hack, everybody says we better do something about it. And what we need to be doing is starting at the top and planning this stuff and that means the business people and the technologists have to be able to talk to each other. And we don't see nearly enough of it. And we got to do it. We got to do it from the factory, the utility, the pipeline, the oil refinery out. And it's time to have this conversation at kind of a business executive and national regulatory level. I think so, Wayne. And even, um, you know, you think back a year ago. Uh, it was certainly a new experience for me where you would go into a grocery store. And there not only was not anything you were looking for available and available almost in full quantity, you know, magically one takes off shelf, boop, another one comes in, but there, there, there were a lot of empty shelves. I, I had never seen that. And I remember that, that feeling like, how could this happen? 
uh, and, you know, but we knew how it happened, but it's just still you're thinking that's just not how our world works, but it does. How could you not have gasoline today? But a lot of places don't. So uh, just because we get lulled into whether it's complacency or accustomed to an extraordinary uh, economy of plenty, uh, it, you know, your, your, your words are right on the mark. As you said, it's right here in front of our face. And we can say, well, that could never happen to me. It's like, mm, I, I don't think so. Um, but as you say, Wayne, maybe that's, uh, that will be a subject for another one of your, your longer discussions here today. But that's, that's a, quite a powerful pointer. So pivot over there from Wayne. What did you want to dig into today? Because that, that one is a good table setter. Sure. So la the last few months, I've been watching you, of course, every morning and listening to your talk about these vertical clouds, the vertical focus of vendors. And as a CIO for many, many years, my comment is hallelujah. I'm glad they're finally recognizing what's going on in the CIO's world, in the customer world. And that's what I want to dig into today. That was my promise last month. And that's what I want to dig into. Let's start with why does it matter to the CEO and the board? that Microsoft or Salesforce or IBM has decided to focus on an industry. It's like, so what? Well, here's why it matters to you at the executive suite. Much faster time to value. We'll dig into why that's true, but just hold that thought. If I can get my ERP integrated from end to end and running in half the time, that's half the time to get the next capability set delivered. Um, it's through fewer throats to choke. Now, HR says, I've got to say, hands to shake these days, but it's fewer vendors to deal with, with the finger pointing of my data was fine, your system is broken. Now it's under the, I can call Microsoft, I can call SAP, I can call IBM. Um, the data model is cleaner. If I've got a vendor that owns the data model, they've got everything integrated within their model and they control it. Now, I want to give kudos to the Salesforce, the Microsoft, the SAPs. They are starting to publish their schemas. Microsoft has the D365 schema in GitHub. So if you want to consume that data, it's right there for you. But it's still a little easier when one company says, this is what we're gonna add next quarter and we can bank on that. And then we've got um, better access because again, if I've got a Microsoft tool or a SAP tool or a Salesforce tool, they know what their data looks like. So it's much quicker to get the canned reports changed when the data changes. And then the last thing is, think about the world of SaaS tools. We're no longer in the every two years we implement the next release, or more likely every eight years we implement nine releases and spend two years. Uh, vendors are talking about four releases a year, six releases a year, 12 releases a year, CI, CD, continuous integration, continuous deployment. Well, if I'm a CIO, if I'm a, a user of this, and I've got to integrate 14 vendors worth of stuff eight times a year. How do I do it? How do we do it without all going mad? So if you're a CEO, if you're a board member, think about that this means cheaper and faster. So Bob, I want to introduce, I'll take a breath for a second, and then I want to introduce Satan's Law of Industry Differentiation. Oh, I like that, Wayne. Looking forward to that. Wayne, you know, uh, you're, you're nailing this, I think, as usual. Let me offer uh, from one of the re recent conversations I've had with one of these big companies about what they're doing that really underscores your point. Um, at IBM, so 13 months ago, <clears throat> Arvind Krishna comes in as the new CEO. Very first day, very first thing he announces is he's bringing over into IBM Howard Beauville, who had been the CTO at Bank of America. And Howard is going to run all of IBM's cloud business. What, things that Howard Beauville has disclosed uh, that he was talking about. He said, when I got to IBM, I, you know, one of the things I said was I wasn't going to buy your cloud products before because they were general purpose. I don't need general purpose. It's not going to help me. I needed something specific to my industry, taken into account security, confidential computing, everything, compliance, regulatory issues. And he said, uh, you know, we barely penetrated some of these large organizations with the cloud. That's because we were offering a generic solution to, to try to meet their increasingly really specific needs. And he said, it just, it, it made no sense. So in this very short period of time, Wayne, as you've said, and what got my attention about it was, I've never seen so many of these big tech companies move in the same direction at the same time with such a sense of purpose and urgency like this. 
And I think for customers, it is going to be fantastic, right? Not that everything that is out now is going to be perfect, but it sure as heck, as you described, it's going in the right direction. Well, since you brought up the customization and the industry specialization from the vendor perspective, let me, let me talk about that. And everybody keep waiting for my law of differentiation. In the old days, when I bought software by the box, they shipped it to me FedEx and I put the tapes on the, on the tape drives, which is how Bank of America did it and Citibank did it and everybody did it. Um, you bought a bunch of software, it came in source code. You tweaked it and customized it and modified it with your army of IT people. And then you compiled it and link edited it and ran it on your mainframe, which by the way, was quite generic with one or two exceptions, air traffic control, some distribution, some manufacturing, IBM made custom mainframes, but generally they were general purpose. And that was the idea. Uh, but so when the vendors had to send you a box code, adding an industry differentiation for 10 different industries, the code stepped on each other and you wound up writing very clumsy kludgy code. As we moved into the modern architecture where we're containerizing, where we're able to partition off what we're doing, where we run the apartment model so I can run multi-users, I've got the ability to build more modularly and to customize more easily. So in the old days, I would get a box of code, I would get 10 other vendors, and I came from the banking industry. So you hear there's core systems. So a bank has a core system, nonsense. The bank has 15 or 20 core systems. There's the security trading system, there's a settlement system, there's a credit card merchant system, there's the credit card issuing system, there's the time deposits, there's the demand deposits, there's the tax advantage deposits, there's the foreign deposits. And then well, let's add the Foreign Corrupt Practices Act and the Know Your Customer, and you wind up with this hodgepodge of applications, none of which know the other one. And so your job as a bank CIO and CTO was to take this mass of spaghetti and stick it together and weave the individual strands of spaghetti together. Now with a standard data model in GitHub and everybody's reading from the same hymnal, it's much easier for a vendor, what they call an ISV, to take the uh, data model of the big company, of the core company and, and work with it. So as a customer now, I can consume stuff that the manufacturers manufacture, the software companies. And it's much easier for them to do this customization where before it would have been very, very hard. So I think part of it is the technology has allowed them to do it. Mm -hmm. And also the market is saying, you've abstracted my hardware. It's called infrastructure as a service. You've abstracted my tools. It's called uh, platform as a service. You've, out, you've abstracted my applications. It's called software as a service. Now I want you to abstract my processes. Let's call that process as a service or industry vertical specialization, which, which takes me nicely to my law of industry differentiation. For 30 years, I've been working across industries. I've worked in financial services, logistics, software, manufacturing, um, healthcare, uh, trucking, uh, lots of industries. And so over the 30 years, I've got a law that works for me. 80% of everything you see at a new company, in a new industry is the same. We buy, we sell, we hire, we fire, we make, we warehouse, we ship, we collect. Um, we do the same horizontal processes. Now they're, they're often siloed, but many times they're not, but they're horizontal. Payroll is payroll largely for any industry you work in. So that's 80%. 10% is industry specialization. That's a percentage of completion accounting in, in uh, some process industries, sorry, project industries. That's uh, union payroll, certified payroll if you're working with the government. So those are industry things. The usual one is adjusted EBITDA. In our industry, we don't use EBITDA like everybody else. We make these tweaks to get rid of the seasonality, the currency fluctuations. We want to make ourselves look better. So adjust that EBIT does industry lipstick on the generic pig. Um, and then there's the 10% that I call folklore or organizational culture. Uh, I once worked for a company that was 160 years old and I joined new, new industry for me. I joined them and they explained how the industry worked. And then about three years later, I had the chance to work with their 155 year old competitor who told me that everything the 160 year old company told me was completely wrong. They didn't get it. And it's really this, they were in the same business. They literally were commodity businesses, but the culture, their folklore. When I say the stories they tell around the campfire differed. So 
let's take that down to a CIO's job. The 80% of horizontal stuff is about a third of my effort in putting in a new ERP. Because I say payroll is payroll. ADP runs my payroll or Microsoft or Workday or whoever. The, that 10% of industry is another third of my workload. That is adding my union and certified payroll, my percentage of completion accounting, my project management, my, my integration of warehouse and trucking and direct to consumer. And the last 10% is on the other third. That's the third of why we are smarter than everybody else in the world in our company. And we should do it our way instead of the way everybody else does it. So if you think about that, middle 10%, the industry 10%, the way we used to do it is, as I said, you'd customize the software for your industry and build something and then maintain it forever. Today, you configure it for your industry. I set the knobs and the dials on my SaaS-based product. Um, so this is the vendor sweet spot. This is the place where the vendor can say, I'm gonna write a banking product or a retail banking product or a US retail banking product and know that most banks could use that product. It is not going to be that last little bit of customization for why Bank America is different than Citicorp. But I will tell you as a CIO, that last 10%, that's a third of the implementation, I own it forever. I have to maintain it forever. I have to integrate it forever. So as a good CIO, a good steward of resource, my job on that last 10% is to show the company why it's really part of the 80 or the other 10 and stop being so bloody custom. Yeah. So the vendors are gonna have less success there because they're gonna to have to do one for each company. That's the world of low code tools. That's the world of, of no code, low code, BI and so on. And give me the tools to do that last little bit of customization and still stay within your fabric. So I think the 80-10-10 rule helps the companies that the vendors see where they should focus and helps me as a CIO get the hard part, the ugly, messy part of my job done. Yeah, yeah. Wayne, I love that. That's a, a, a dramatic and probably for a lot of people, I think an unexpected break out of that. But the way you've described it and how you laid it out really makes perfect sense there. Um, Wayne, let me jump in here for a word from our sponsor, BMC. BMC wants to know, is your business on its A game? That's when systems are intelligent by learning from markets, where automation is paramount yet effortless, and when technology and people work as one in an enterprise. The A game is your business at its absolute best. BMC calls this the autonomous digital enterprise. Find out more at bmc.com slash A game. So Wayne, I had a couple of notes recently from CIOs and uh, one is currently a CIO, uh, another has moved over to work at Deloitte, but uh, most of his career as a CIO, he said, uh, he said, I'm really worried that all this, you know, industry specific stuff is just the latest rah, rah. And he said, is this stuff really going to be sort of industrial strength? Is it going to be dependable enough, trustworthy and so on? I, I'd like to get your impression because I know, you know, my reaction was, look, uh, it's a new field what exists today will probably be much better in two or three years, but I think it's all pointed in the right direction. And Salesforce has built a $2 billion business out of it pretty quickly. So um, I, I think this stuff is all quite real. I, I, I don't get any of a sense here that this is a fad or this is something that all, you know, a year from now people say, what was that we got all worked up about, you know, 12 months ago. I, I don't see that happening. And I, I was encouraged by some of your, commentary throughout here, your analysis to say that this is what a lot of business people have been looking for. Oh, absolutely. The, the thing, the problem we have is the business people are looking for this, but the business people don't see the vendor stuff. It's filtered through the CIO. So really the key is going to be getting the message out to the economic buyer, to the CFO, to the CEO, to the board member. You know, it's not the old days and we're still having a problem. People still think that implementing a SaaS based ERP or CRM or even an EHR electronic health record system is like you implemented a box of software that came FedEx 25 years ago. And when I work with board members, I always hear, yeah, but 20 years ago when I implemented a product X, it's almost always SAP just because they have the market share. I ran into this. It cost twice as much, took twice as long, blah, blah, blah. 
And I said to them, by the way, you're probably still running that same version today, which is the problem you don't even realize you had. And, and so the message has to be communicated to the economic buyer that we are giving you something that will save time and money and get you time to value quicker. So this is largely the industries to win or lose by messaging. If they don't tell the story correctly, if it's just seen as we're gonna sell different software, you know, old wine and new bottles, eh, if they show it as the confluence of software change, process understanding, and the need to get things going faster, and integrate across process a, a digression. As the CIO, I'm one of two people in an organization that sees the company from yeah. the customer at one end to the delivery and collection at the other. The CFO is the other one. The manufacturing people, sales, everybody sees the silos. The CFO sees the financial flow across from one end of the company to the other. As the CIO, I see all the flows, the manufacturing data, the customer data, the maintenance data, the financial data. So we've gotta be, the vendors have to be thinking about how do they help me as the CIO and how do they help the company implement a multi-silo process? And so that's gonna be their challenge. Now, Bob, when you talk about the size of this industry, I hate to disagree with you, but I think you've got it way undercounted. And the reason is the channel, na channel nature of the software industry. If I'm a direct to, uh, to, re to a business uh, sales company, like IBM typically, or SAP, the big clients, then I'm seeing it in their numbers. But if you think about the software industry, so much of it is through the indirect channel. Yeah. That is selling through bars and ISVs. So for those that don't know, an ISV is an independent software vendor. They write their own software and they somehow integrate it into the big systems. And then there's the VAR, the value-added remarketer. And now a lot of them emphasize the R, the remarketer. I'm gonna collect a piece of everything you said, Microsoft or company A. The value-added is where I wanna focus. Mm -hmm. So if I'm buying a product that is generic and I wanna customize it, I will find me a VAR that is a manufacturing bar or that is a distribution bar or that is a construction bar, or that's a financial services bar. And what they're doing is they're taking software from a bunch of ISVs. Again, if in financial services, it's know your customer, it's Foreign Corrupt Practices Act, it's certain other calculations I have to do. And they're stitching them into the suite that I'm buying. So in an indirect model, you are not seeing the bottom of the iceberg, the Deloitte's and the KPMG's and all the billions we spend tailoring software for our industry. So ask yourself this question, how do you capture the size of this real market? Because nobody buys a software out of a box and says, I'm done, right? They're either doing it themselves or they're doing it with help, typically with an industry specialist. So you've got to add up all the revenue of all of the industry practices in all of these VARs and all of these ISVs. And my guess is you're off by a factor of five or six or 10. So what this is doing is it's saying, I'm gonna take all of these peripheral things supported by companies that are one person, five people, 20 people that may not speak the same language I speak. I bought software from companies in Austria, Czechoslovakia, the, the, old, Soviet, the old Soviet Union, um, of course, India. And we're talking about language barriers and translation problems. If IBM or Microsoft or Salesforce is taking this in, I know they're localizing it properly. I don't have to worry about how many languages. I was implementing something for a customer and we had a VAR involved and they said, oh yes, we have multi-language, English and Spanish with their IP. And then of course, Microsoft said we have 120 languages. Which would I rather have if I'm a global company? So that's the challenge. I mean, the good news for me is my channel conflict goes largely away if I can buy from Microsoft or Salesforce or somebody an integrated suite, or at the very least, it lives in their app store. And I want to make a comment about app stores. I looked this morning, the D365 app store shows 3,000 plus products that integrate into D365. ADP, the stodgy old payroll vendor, uh -uh. they list 600 applications that integrate into the ADP ecosystem. And Salesforce has 225 that I saw in their store this morning. So at the very least, I have that level of integration. They've been approved to be in the store, which means they 
past some hurdles. So I'm more confident as a buyer, that this is going to meet my needs. And then I can go back to the Microsoft or Salesforce or ADP if it doesn't and say, help me, versus calling up software companies. Uh, hey, quick story. 30 years, 25 years ago, I was gonna do mortgages on the internet. And the board said, I want everything on the internet. And I found a mortgage software company. It was six people in the Pacific Northwest. And I was working for uh, the biggest bank in Texas at the time. And I made a deal with them. If I gave them an order for their software, they would take the servers out of the broom closet in the CEO's house and the backup out of the vice president's basement. And to do business with, I went in front of my board and said, good news, bad news. I got a company. However, they have a few warts on them because they didn't have the funding. And so we gave them the funding and I'll ha happily say they got bought by a bigger company and lived happily ever after and did what I wanted. But that's a scary heart and mouth moment. And by the way, if I was Howard Moville at Bank America, I couldn't say that to my board. They got the software in the basement. So you wind up being very constrained on who you can do business with. But if you're an ISV or VAR company, your world is gonna change. So my message to ISVs is get ready to be sold in a seller's market. Yes. Everybody wants the crown jewels of your customization, but because the business is going to change for them. If you're a VAR, it's a much less settled space. So I rarely comment on the industry because I don't know it, I'm a buyer. But if I'm a VAR and, and I'm now presented with Microsoft sells my or Salesforce sells my and they'll help me implement it, Am I then becoming a white label to them? Which can happen. I'll, I'll buy from vendor A and the work is produced by a subcontractor. I don't care. Or they buy my company or they buy my people, move my people over and start doing what I do. So the world is gonna change, Bob. And I think you'll see that the, uh, the dollars in these industry verticals are gonna go through the roof quickly, but they're not new revenue. They're revenue shifting from the indirect channel under the covers of the direct sales vendor. And that may be why you see Salesforce posting such a big number compared to Microsoft. Even though I dare say my limited experience, Microsoft's probably doing a lot more, but because they're largely an indirect vendor, they're doing it through other people's P&Ls. So the, the thing for me as a CIO is that I get the benefits of this. And for the comment you said people made, for me, the benefit of having an integrated package means I can choose the default vendor solution. So if Microsoft or Salesforce or Workday offers me a package, great. But the architecture of SaaS says, if I don't like what they have, I can integrate somebody else's product. Some of the work and risk and cost and time moves to me, but it's not the old world where I chose a suite or best of breed. And there were very two stark extremes. Now I get a sweet-ish, maybe we should coin that term. We're gonna get Swedish software. Hmm. And, and I can buy an integrated working thing out of the box, but if I need, I need advanced equipment maintenance or I need high-end project management or some specialized accounting, sales tax, for example, I can plug it right in and have a better product than what the original vendor offered. And by the way, that's also intelligence back to the Microsoft, Salesforce, and Workday. If everybody chooses not to buy their thing, but buys this third party, maybe that's the next target for an acquisition. By the way, when I was looking at D365, two different vendor products that I was looking at integrating were bought by Microsoft in this time frame, And I just had to wait till they showed up in the core product, which saved me money, saved me lots of time and lots of aggravation. Yeah. So we're in the as a customer, I'm in the best of both worlds. I get a suite that I can pull apart or in, implement together, and someone can do as much of the heavy lifting as I want. But I can still using low code, no code, using the data model, using the BI tools, using the marketplace, adapt it how I want. So there's never been a better time to be a software buyer, and there's never been a better product family to buy than these integrated products from the major vendors. Yeah, yeah, Wayne, great stuff. I uh, I sure agree, you know, there's, we did a, a few days ago an episode of Cloud Wars Minute where I talked about uh, a company called Viva, V-E-E-V-A, and uh, they're probably 
uh, going to make it uh, pretty soon onto the industry cloud top 10. They work uh, on the Salesforce platform and they work uh, in life sciences. So they do you know, the whole end to end thing for life science from clinical trials to CRM. So it's interesting as I've been researching the way and I saw a couple articles saying, hey, if you're even vaguely in this space of life sciences, healthcare, so on like that, what's the better CRM product for you, Salesforce or Viva? And uh, so it is interesting, right? You know, as you've said here, the, the channel, the followers, again, it is a fantastic deal for the customer because you can get your choice, find the one that fits your needs most appropriately. And uh, I, I, it's all the stuff you've said, Wayne, I agree with completely the channel, the people that are pulling along like this. I think it's going to be a, uh, a seller's market coming up. All these companies are going to be scouring to see how can I get these specialized companies coming in. And what was it, you know, a month ago, Microsoft buying Nuance for $20 billion. And Nuance has $1.3, $1.4 billion in revenue. They're not growing. But uh, Microsoft says they're going to be an indispensable part of the new healthcare cloud for Microsoft. So uh, it, it's it's a remarkable time. And for me, I think one of the interesting things, it's not just an inside the tech industry game, but the, the benefits, the results, the opportunities for customers are going to be so enormous. And that's the thing that uh, I find to be most exciting about it. Absolutely. The challenge as we started by saying is we've got to get the message to the right buyer. Look. There are a lot of CIOs, as we've talked about, who are not real CIOs in the modern sense. They're not business enablers, they're IT geeks. And they're gonna say, no, I can, do, I can do it better. Well, just let me do it, it's technical. But the real answer is what is the best mix of time to value, of maintenance, of cost, of risk? And that's the conversation that have, has to happen at the board of directors level. If I'm going to implement a new ERP, CRM, EHR, whatever it is, that's a board level discussion these days. And it really probably always has been, but it has nuances. What are we going to do for the OT? We talked about that at the beginning. How does it integrate into my equipment? Uh, again, I'm D365 user now. So Microsoft came up with an advanced maintenance product that they purchased. And now it connects directly to my trucks, directly to my equipment, so I can take telemetry data and do proactive and predictive maintenance. And I'm getting so OT telemetry from an IT vendor. Yeah. Same with healthcare. If I'm buying a healthcare product and it talks to my devices that are the scale sitting in my patient's bathroom, how can I use that data to deliver a better healthcare product both inside my walls and outside my walls. So it's a terrific time to be doing this and a terrific time as a buyer to be leveraging these vendors and saying, do more for me because I don't want to be in the software business any more than I want to be in the server business, right? What did we do in this past? I was in the server business. I bought mainframes and built buildings to put them in. And if I was the Bank of America or Citibank or Morgan Stanley, where I consulted many years ago, we filled buildings with these things. And then we customized them for us, which took months and years and millions and millions of dollars. Now we've abstracted that. I'm going to buy my servers from somewhere else and I don't care how they do it. And then I'm going to buy my tools and I'm going to buy my apps. At the end of the day, where the CIO earns, earns their, their money is by looking at the processes and mapping them across the applications. Applications tend to be vertical, processes tend to be horizontal, and then extending the boundaries of the enterprise outside of our four walls and looking at customer and supplier. To go back to your DTC that started this, how do I integrate my company into the global supply chain better than other people? It's not by having a better payroll system, it's by having a better view of my ecosystem. And what this is freeing me to do is get off the treadmill of, oh, I got a new release of that, we gotta get put in to the vendors doing the easy stuff and now I can focus on the high value stuff. And that's the message for boards and for C-suites and for your, your industry customers. They've really got to understand this 80-10-10. A, a comment I'll make, people like me who've worked in five or 10 industries would be very handy because I can say, how is the mortgage industry similar to the energy industry? How is the transportation industry different from the banking industry? And you've got to be able to say what's in the 80 and where I can do what I've got to do and what's in the 10 and what's in that final 10. So your industry folks should start thinking about cross industry consortia. How do you get people to think in a think tank environment to figure out 
what looks the same but has different jargon, different terminology. Yeah. So there's it's it's a great it's a great time to be in this business. It's a great time to be an ISV. May not be a great time to be a VAR, but we'll see how that plays out. And it's a wonderful time to be a consumer of all of this stuff. It certainly is. It certainly is. Well, Professor Sain, you might have outdone yourself today. And uh, thank you for sharing your formula on the uh, 801010. Uh, that, that's a dandy. Uh, Wayne, it was really, really interesting. Um, the, the future's coming at us awfully fast these days, isn't it? And uh, I think these sorts of things are only going to accelerate that development. Amen. We need it. Uh, the pandemic is forcing it. We need it. And it's coming at the right time. Perfect. Well, Wayne, thanks a million. Always good to see you. And folks, all of you, thanks for being with us here at Cloud Wars Live. Wayne will be back next month. And I'm sure, again, he'll have some fascinating ideas to share with everybody. Hope it's a great day for you. So long.